Arco Forum of the Kennedy School of Government. Our theme tonight, Case Study Armenia, United States Foreign Policy, Values, and the Humanitarian Impulse. I'm Marvin Kalb, Director of the Shorenstein Barone Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy, and it's my pleasure tonight to have been asked to moderate this panel on this theme. Armenia was, as we all know, one of the former Soviet republics. With the collapse of the communist regime, Armenia became an independent state, but one that has been strapped economically and locked into a bloody conflict with neighboring Azerbaijan, principally over a piece of territory known as Nagorno-Karabakh. On both sides, thousands have been killed, many more made homeless. A compromise solution is neither apparent nor imminent. In this post-Cold War world, what should be the shape of U.S. policy toward Armenia? And perhaps we'll get into another question, places like Armenia. A good panel, as we all know, is directly dependent upon good panelists. And we have those in very good supply tonight. Uh, on my right, William Walsh, President and Chief Executive Officer of Project HOPE. Where he has worked, he tells me, despite his appearance, 33 years overseeing projects all over the world. Professor Alice Kalikian of Brandeis University traveled frequently to the Caucasus, written about the conflict there for a number of newspapers here and in Europe. Garnik Nana Gulian, who was the Minister Counselor and Deputy Chief of Mission of the Embassy of the Republic of Armenia to the United States of America. Baroness Carolyn Ann Cox of Queensbury, who is Deputy Speaker of the House of Lords in the United Kingdom. She has worked with Christian Solidarity International to fly humanitarian assistance to Armenia and to Armenians in Azerbaijan. Ambassador John Mareska, who has been the special U.S. negotiator on the problem of Nagorno-Karabakh since February 1992. He's tried to organize a ceasefire and open direct negotiations between the combatants on the future status of the region. And finally, William Taylor is the Senior Program Director for the Coordinator of Assistance to the 12 newly independent states, formerly parts of the old Soviet Union. Congress has appropriated $2.5 billion toward this effort. Mr. Taylor may succeed in this job for only one reason, he holds a Master of Public Policy degree from the Kennedy School of Government. We will start with a two-minute presentation. Two minutes is what I say. What they do is another matter. Uh, but I've asked for a two-minute presentation from each of the panelists. Uh, I may then ask a question of one or the other of them. They can then ask questions of one another. And as you look around the forum tonight, you will see that there are four microphones, two down here and two up there. And uh, there will be a time in about 40, 45 minutes when you and the audience can ask the panelists questions. Uh, when you do, please keep your question brief, identify yourself, and I would ask the panelists as well to keep their answers brief. Mr. Walsh. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm talking to you. Uh, from the perspective of a uh, organization, Project Hope, whose uh, mission is to uh, help disadvantaged communities uh, throughout the world provide more and better health services to their people. Uh, last year, we helped some uh, 37 uh, nations, and we had uh, our expenditures were approximately $107 million. Uh, we have provided assistance to all of the uh, former Soviet states. Uh, our involvement and my own involvement in Armenia began in January of 1989, uh, just after the earthquake. And I led a team of uh, uh, orthopedic uh, surgeons and medical professionals. And uh, we went to Armenia to see what we could do to help victims of the earthquake but most importantly for us was that we went to see what we could do for the long term in the recovery of Armenia uh, from the horrible uh, disaster. Uh, we have um, 
we set out very specific objectives, namely the development of rehabilitation capabilities uh, in physical medicine, that which Armenia was totally devoid of uh, at the time of the earthquake. And uh, over the course of our assistance, uh, over the last five years, we provided some uh, $15 million worth of assistance. Uh, we established a pediatric uh, rehabilitation center, uh, which today is uh, operated by the uh, Armenian uh, government with the people we trained. We also uh, did humanitarian assistance, provision of emergency medical supplies throughout the country. And the third piece was that we were a, <clears throat> served as a lead agency in a consortium of uh, private voluntary organizations made up of the uh, uh, Project Hope, the American Red Cross, uh, the Joint Distribution uh, Committee, and the Armenian Assembly of America, which conducted health programs and housing programs uh, for the past five years. I feel that referring to the uh, topic of today's uh, discussion that the humanitarian impulse is very much driven by the values of uh, one has as a society and perhaps as a world, both your history and, and your culture uh, determine your ideals. And I think that during the beginning when the earthquake uh, took place, there was a very sincere demonstration of idealism uh, throughout the world, perhaps uh, unparalleled. But I think underneath humanitarian impulse and commitment to ideals is also uh, a sense of purpose, a sense of opportunity. I think there was no question that people saw the Armenia as a path to a more peaceful world. And part of the motivations of both uh, business and governments was was to try to walk along that path with Armenia being the corridor. I don't have to tell this uh, audience that how the situation has uh, changed. And I think that the challenge that we all face, all of us who care about the Armenians that we helped and the children that uh, we helped after the earthquake, is to how do you go about sustaining humanitarian impulse in the changed uh, circumstances. And just as, since I've had the opportunity to be the first speaker, I hope to be the last, I will give my uh, kind of cookbook as to how this might be done. I'm sure other panelists will, will uh, have their own thoughts. Uh, we have to keep in mind that Armenia has been the, after the Russian Federation, has been the largest recipient of U.S. assistance. And uh, and looking ahead, that the, I think you know, we have to be realistic and consider that the, it's very likely that the amount of assistance available, the food and the medicines that were provided, uh, the technical assistance in the, long, in the intermediate term and, and longer term is certainly uh, likely to decline. And so that American leadership, which has been critical all along, will be very critical, but more from a, not a leadership in terms of economic investment, but a leadership in terms of uh, personal commitment. So if we want to sustain the humanitarian spirit, the foreign policy and American leadership, I think it's the number one uh, ingredient. I think multilaterals have to be far more involved than they have been. I think there must be much better cooperation between European and American efforts. I think it's extreme, and I think that the Japanese uh, can play a much more significant role than they have. I think above all, all those who are interested in uh, continuing the efforts in Armenia must have uh, determination, uh, dedication, and maybe above everything, creativity, because it's not an easy place to work. And I don't think that if you look at the external environments, uh, the relations with countries around Armenia don't think there's any likelihood that that will change substantially in the next three to five years. So in short, I think that the humanitarian impulse, the, that it's conjoining with American foreign policy has been very well demonstrated by the case of Armenia. 
and that the challenge ahead is to sustain it in a new, far more pragmatic terms in which we are find ourselves now. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Professor Kalikian. I teach history at Brandeis, but I first went to Radebach in January 1991 disguised as a musician. I borrowed a passport from a resident of the Enclave because that was the only way in during that last year, year of Soviet rule. I have since been back to Nakhichevan to eastern Turkey. During my trips to Armenia, I spent much time interviewing refugees, politicians, Armenian fighters, and the troops of the former Soviet 4th and 7th armies. I'll talk briefly for the next minute that I have uh, about the struggle uh, over Karabakh, the enclave populated by Armenians under the jurisdiction of Azerbaijan. The latest round of the Karabakh issue began, as you all know, as a movement for self-determination in the best spirit of Glasnost. And Azerbaijan responded to that challenge with pogroms, with deportations, and worse. Then the collapse of the Soviet Union turned this pauper's war into a regional battleground of geopolitical significance to Russia, to Turkey, and to Iran. Six years have passed with no end in sight. Armenians insist on their right to self-determination while Azerbaijan appeals to its newly found territorial integrity. Peacemakers who have attempted to mediate this conflict have not been generous or even handed to the Armenian side. Neither the CS, CE, nor the UN resolutions acknowledge the right to self-determination on the part of Armenians in Karabakh, but rather insist on the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, and on Azerbaijan which has refused to ensure the life, security, and safety of its ethnic minority. Following this logic, I would argue, the efforts of the international community to put an end to any bloodshed will surely come to naught. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Minister. Yeah. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, I, I found the words, tough choices for Armenia, accompanying the title of this conference. And I just it occurred to me that the people of Armenia has always been, uh, they, they, there was always a question about a tough choice for Armenians, beginning from the ancient times when Armenians were choosing the Christianity as their religion, up to the point uh, the genocide in 1915 and the Sovietization of Armenia when the Stalin's Machiavellian uh, uh, mapping of Armenia was implemented. Armenians always uh, were at the point when there was uh, a question of a tough choice. Uh, right now it is happening in Karabakh as well. And the tough choice is taking, uh, taken by all the parties, the Karabakh Armenians, the Azerbaijanis, and the Armenians in, in Armenia. Unfortunately, the choice for Karabakh Armenians is narrowing because they have no other choice just to take the arms in their hands and to protect their land and their homes and their families. The choice of the government of Armenia that I represent here is clear and it was declared and I think it has the appreciation of the international community. My government is uh, my government's choice is peace, and it uh, demonstrated its commitment to peace both at the time when Karabakh was uh, suffering terrible defeats and at the time when Karabakh was uh, quite successful on the battlefield. Uh, I represent a government which is uh, unique in the former Soviet Union. Some five years ago, a group of intellectuals, uh, romantic intellectuals, came together and decided to do something which at that time was unbelievable, just to create an independent Armenia. And they were, uh, they were committed to this course, they were committed to democracy, they were committed to uh, new ideas, and they demonstrated that, and they were imprisoned for their ideals. And today, this is the only government in the former Soviet Union, as I understand, which, uh, which is continuing to do that, being at the power as well. Uh, we represent this government here in the United States, in the capital of the, the only superpower in the world, and we are trying to get better understanding of the United States government, and we're trying to get not only better understanding, may, but maybe a more active role for the United States to participate in the peace process in Armenia. But we understand that we are, we are not alone in the world. You know how many people are 
looking for the better understanding and more U.S. Uh, uh, more active U.S. role in, in the peacemaking efforts all around the world. But anyhow, down the road, I will be ready to answer the questions when you would like to ask how we are doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lady Cox. Thank you. Good evening. I'd just like to begin with a very brief personal introduction, highlighting those aspects which I hope give me some credentials for taking part in this debate, and then just to touch on one or two of the issues which I think this debate should generate. My primary profession is a nurse. Um, as a patient with TB, I moved out of nursing. Subsequently, I became an academic sociologist. I became a politician by surprise when I was catapulted to my never-ending astonishment into the House of Lords as a life peer in 1982. Since being there, I have adopted a principle which I think ought to apply to all principles, all politicians in democracies. It's a commitment to trying to have open ears, open eyes, and an open mind before you have an open mouth. And I try to um, put that into effect uh, insofar as I use the House of Lords as an arena for advocacy, not only as a nurse on behalf of healthcare issues, but also where I'm deeply committed to concerns on human rights and humanitarian need. My personal experience in those areas, I worked as a nurse for a while in remote area desert work in Sudan in North Kordofan with Muslim communities developing an immunization program. I was privileged to do a lot of work with Poland in the dark years of martial law, taking in medical aid and again working with human rights. That led me in due course to being involved with human rights issues in Russia and to working with Yelena Bona Sakharov at the Congress, which she initiated as a commemoration of what would have been her husband's 70th birthday. I was chairing the group of experts there in Moscow at that Congress when the tragic uh, situation with regard to the deportations being undertaken in May 1991 by the Azeri Ministry of Interior Forces and the Soviet Fourth Army emerged through our agenda, and I was asked to lead an international independent delegation to the area to investigate, which included uh, American citizens as well as those of many other nationalities. We were deeply concerned by the evidence we found. Committed to impartiality, we returned a second time, the next time going through Azerbaijan to hear the Azeri point of view. Our conclusions, based on the evidence, has led us to the view that in this tragic conflict, it is the Armenians who are the primary victim, and particularly the Armenians of Karabakh, in terms of the uh, violations of human rights. And following in the footsteps of Andrei Sakharov, we try to be on the side of the victim. We were very concerned about the humanitarian needs, particularly of the Armenians of Karabakh, suffering the double effects of blockade and bombardment. It was then I involved the organization Christian Solidarity International, which is a human rights organization, but which tries to work for victims of repression, regardless of their color, creed, or nationality. I must just correct a point made by the chairman, if I may. We have taken aid not only to the Armenians, in Azerbaijan or in Karabakh. We have also taken aid to the Azeris, and I'm also currently involved in a major aid project in Azerbaijan, so we do try to be impartial in our concerns for those who are in need. But as I've said, I think the uh, tragic situation in Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Karabakh raises very profound issues, and I'd just like to flag up three. First of all, very briefly, the challenge that Karabakh and the conflict there poses to the international community with regard to human rights. What does the international community do when a sovereign state decides to discriminate against, indeed to try to annihilate uh, a minority population within it? The United Nations, a CSCE, is premised technically on twin principles of commitment to territorial integrity and respect for human rights. But certainly in Karabakh, there seems to have been a greater commitment to territorial integrity than to the protection of the human rights of the people of Karabakh. Secondly, on humanitarian aid, what does the international community do when a sovereign state denies access to a minority population within it, which it is trying to annihilate? That has been one of the great problems in Karabakh. Um, Azerbaijan, being the sovereign state, has not been giving invitations to major UN organizations. CSI, as an independent charitable organization, can put humanitarian need before political constraints which is why I've been privileged to visit the Armenians of Karabakh 17 times and due to go back again on Friday week. But the situation in Karabakh exemplifies that in many other parts of the world, southern Sudan, uh, Mozambique, Renamo versus Frelimo, where you have minorities being discriminated against by recognized governments. Karabakh is a test case for these issues. I look forward to discussing them. I hope if a positive way forward could be found, it could be a precedent providing hope elsewhere in the world. 
if a solution cannot be found for Karabakh, that situation can escalate as it is escalating today while we sit here, could extend the bloodshed, could even become a regional war with unforeseen and incalculable suffering. So I congratulate those who've organized this symposium because it is so timely and so significant. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ambassador Moresco. The United States uh, <clears throat> first uh, became involved in this um, area two years ago when the countries there became independent. Prior to that time, of course, it had been an internal Soviet problem, and we were not involved, nor we were, were we present. We, we became involved as part of an international group which went out to the area uh, to learn more about the problem. I was a part of that group. It was the first of many visits I've made since then, and uh, when I visited Nagorno-Karabakh, like others, I was deeply moved by the suffering. And since that time, I have been the lead person in the U.S. government trying to find a way to establish a basis for a ceasefire, for international monitoring of that ceasefire, because we know ceasefires without uh, some kind of international uh, watch will, will not last, and to establish a basis for some rational negotiating process about the future of Nagorno-Karabakh. I have been uh, pursuing that objective for the last two years, and just to give you a very brief idea of what that means, I have traveled close to a half a million miles. I have visited Moscow 16 times. I've visited the area many times. I've met with the leaders of the countries and of Nagorno-Karabakh many times. I have negotiated, sometimes secretly, sometimes publicly, in half the cities of Europe. Uh, so far, we have not reached a conclusion. We have come close I think on two or three occasions. We have agreed on one document. Uh, in December of 1992, I personally negotiated an agreement that was agreed by both sides. It fell apart the following morning. This is, uh, I would say, just a tip of the iceberg of the kind of experience that we have been through during the last two years. I would add, and this is not well known, but you should know it, that your government, the United States government, has been the leading force in pressing these international negotiations. We began them. We were the ones who found all the ways to move ahead. We were the ones who kept it going. We were the ones who ensured that neither the Russians nor the Turks ran off in strange directions. In other words, we were the ones who made an international negotiation happen. And I also believe that we did succeed, have succeeded, in creating a credible negotiating forum. We have also brought together enough international support so that if there ever is a, a stable ceasefire, we will have an international group of monitors to go in and watch over it. This is all largely because of the efforts of the United States government. But I am sad to report that we have not found a conclusion. And I would have to add that, in my view, we are perhaps farther away from a solution now than we were a year ago. My own feeling at the very outset was that we had to move very quickly. Because the deeper we got into this war, the more difficult it was going to become. Even if it did not expand, and Baroness Cox is correct in pointing to the risks of internationalization of this war, they, from the very beginning, have been the truly scary thing about this conflict, uh, that it could easily draw in Russia or Turkey or Iran or all three. Um, but I believe that the present time we are farther away. And I would also say that, uh, from an Armenian point of view, it is especially important to resolve this conflict. I fear for Armenia. Each time I go there, I see that the situation has deteriorated further. These are times when people in Yerevan and people in this room know that. These are times when intellectuals are burning their books to keep warm, when people are chopping up the family piano to burn it, etc. 
Armenia cannot exist economically or even, I would say, as an independent state if this war cannot be resolved. Armenia has to, for example, have some kind of a normal relationship with Turkey, which is the way west for Armenia. It is the only way west for Armenia. But right now, I would have to tell you that I'm very discouraged about this process. There are many reasons for this, but I would cite the three reasons which I think are the most important ones. The first is that Azerbaijan has been humiliated on the battlefield. There is a weak government in Baku, and like many weak governments, it is extremely difficult for the Azeri government to make any concessions. As long as they are in a situation of such humiliation, it will not be possible for them to move toward a peace agreement. That is one reason. It is largely irrational, because as in the case of Armenia, uh, Azerbaijan could become very prosperous very quickly in a situation of peace, and especially if that peace included a peace with Armenia. The second major reason is that the Nagorno-Karabakh armed forces are now occupying about a quarter of the territory of Azerbaijan outside of Nagorno-Karabakh, including some uh, regional centers and cities, some of which have been destroyed. As long as that occupation goes on, it is very difficult to see a peace agreement. And the third of these major reasons is the role of Russia. Russia essentially does not want the international community to find a solution to this problem. Russia wants to solve it themselves in order to reestablish their dominance in the area. And they have been carrying on a competing effort with the international community's effort. All of this leads me to a rather pessimistic conclusion right now. But obviously, uh, one must persevere, and I'm sure this process will go forward. Uh, I will be happy to go into details on this, but I see Marvin looking at me, and so I will uh, conclude my remarks and look forward to your questions. I look at you in the most friendly way, I <laughs> <laughs> um, I said before that $2.5 billion had been appropriated by uh, Congress and one of the people in the U.S. government responsible for figuring out how that money is to be spent, where it is to be spent, in what were the republics of the Soviet Union is uh, Mr. <coughs> William Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Cow. Uh, good evening. I am very pleased to join this distinguished uh, crew here to talk to you about these kinds of issues. I visited Yerevan last summer um, and undoubtedly got uh, an unusual look and an uncharacteristic, uh, unrepresentative look uh, in that uh, electricity was on most of the time I was there. The, uh, the elevators worked in the, in the uh, hotel I was staying in, and there was hot water, which is not the case, uh, at, as most of you know. Uh, and, and because the situation in Yerevan and Armenia is so grim and is so difficult, uh, the United States government, uh, uh, in addition to the efforts that Ambassador Mreska just described, has mounted a large, it will never be sufficient, <clears throat> but a large assistance program for Armenia, indeed for all 12 of the former Soviet republics. This assistance began in uh, 1992, early 1992, uh, when the Soviet Union disappeared in late 1991, and it began as a humanitarian uh, effort. You may remember the, the uh, uh, television shots of these large aircraft leaving Frankfurt, uh, destined for all 12 uh, destinations in all 12 of the, of the former Soviet republics, including Yerevan. Uh, since that time, $288 million of, uh, of U.S. taxpayers' money, uh, the value of $288 million has been sent to Armenia. Uh, this, on a per capita basis, um, as, as Bill Walsh has pointed out, uh, is more than any other uh, uh, government, uh, any other former Soviet republic, including the Russians, by far. Um, on a per capita basis, it's been about 95, nearly $100 per person, uh, per Armenian, and about 160 pounds of food uh, per Armenian. This, this, is as, actually this is actually delivered, that's correct. Uh, because this program, as I, as I mentioned, began in early 1992, um, uh, for again, for all 12, and there have been funds available uh, during that time. 
uh, and this uh, 288 million has, has indeed uh, been delivered. This project, uh, of course, will continue, and this year, uh, as Mr. Cowell has pointed out, we have two and a half billion dollars spread, again, across, uh, across 12 of the countries. Uh, some of you are aware that, uh, just a little current events, uh, some of you are aware that uh, we are making an effort to provide kerosene uh, in, in fairly large bulk, again, insufficient bulk, but, uh, but fairly large bulk, uh, to Yerevan for distribution to Armenians. Uh, because of the severe winter, and because of the lack of fuel, lack of fuel is, is at least as uh, big a problem as, as some of the others. Uh, uh, we have provided uh, 72,000 metric tons so far. There, we've been, some of you may know that we've been moving, trying to get three trains uh, of kerosene through Georgia into Yerevan. And those three trains have now arrived. Uh, they arrived, I believe it was yesterday, and uh, uh, with the help of uh, uh, several people on both ends. We have some Americans uh, both in Yerevan and in uh, the, the Georgian port of Batumi to try to to try to uh, assist and, and facilitate the movement of this, of this oil. That just brings up a point that has already been made several times, that uh, Armenia being landlocked and being surrounded by neighbors uh, who are not eager to, to uh, assist Armenians, it makes it very difficult for our operation to get assistance through. And so moving across uh, the rail lines through Georgia, through the Georgian ports, to, across the rail lines into uh, Armenia has been very difficult. Uh, we have gotten uh, this, this uh, uh, kerosene through. Turns out it was Japanese purchased kerosene. Uh, we, the United States government paid for the transportation, but the Japanese bought the kerosene. Uh, we have also provided, uh, in the process of providing, about 100,000 kerosene heaters uh, to be used to, uh, uh, to, to warm the homes and to cook the food. Uh, these heaters have been purchased in Korea, and again transported by the United States government. So it is indeed an international effort that, uh, that continues. It will have to continue. Uh, we will look to the leadership of this kind of uh, discussion and, and ideas coming from this kind of discussion to, to guide us on how we move forward on this. Uh, the principal concern that we've had in Armenia has been humanitarian. We would like to be able to move from humanitarian assistance into technical assistance, economic assistance, democratic reform assistance, uh, to encourage those kinds of activities rather than just trying to keep people warm and, and fed. Uh, that's the goal that, that uh, we share, and in order to do that, uh, Ambassador Mareska and his efforts, are, and all of the folks in this room as well, will have to focus on resolving the conflict. Uh, we think that's, that's a, the important piece of, uh, to provide uh, continued assistance. And I'll look forward to answering any questions later on. Aside from the general proposition, that, which I think everyone would share, that we would like to end the conflict, if I could put a question to any member of the panel, uh, what is the single most important thing that could be done right now to help alleviate this problem? What would you think? Professor. Lifting the economic blockade uh, by Turkey of Armenia. That is what's... And <laughs> Armenia is in the middle of a third winter in the dark, in the cold, with no food, no fuel, no electricity. It can't continue much longer. It's, it'd be a goodwill gesture if Turkey were to allow commerce to come in through the Black Sea. It hasn't done that. It won't even let U.S. flights fly over its airspace. Now, the question that comes up, obviously, is that Turkey gets a good bit of money each year. I forgot what it was, two, three hundred million dollars in aid, which would suggest that the U.S. has a degree of leverage on Turkey. Um, that proposition, uh, Mr. Ambassador, is that one that has been put to you before, and what has been your response and your effort? Well, I agree 100% that the blockade should be lifted. And uh, I don't know, I can't, it couldn't even count the numbers of times, the number of times that I've raised this with the Turks. We've raised it with them on, uh, at every level, including at the presidential level. What's uh, their answer? You have to, I think a lot of people in this room know this region, and uh, so, uh, I think a lot of people will understand what I'm about to say about Turkey. Uh, Turkey is a country uh, that is, in many ways is backward. 
I mean to say there is a large public opinion out there uh, which is very primitive in many ways. And uh, at, the, at the top, there is a sophisticated government. Uh, the sophisticated government uh, responds very closely to public opinion. And public opinion in Turkey is extremely favorable to Azerbaijan. And is, there is no possibility for a Turkish government to last if it lifts that blockade. Now, we have pressed them. We, I think, uh, uh, I think uh, that would certainly be a, a key element. And I, I, for one, believe that in any case, humanitarian aid should always be allowed through in any circumstances. Uh, Lady Cox, is there an uh, effort now being made in the West European diplomatic environment to get Turkey to lift this blockade? I think absolutely insufficient. Um, there is talk, but clearly Turkey has not responded to talk. Um, in a debate which I initiated in the House of Lords in December, not last December, but 13 months ago, uh, Turkey had told uh, the British government it was going to give Armenia humanitarian aid in the form of a cheap rate electricity. Well, all I would say is that the British government appeared to believe that because it was given in response to the debate I initiated as a, a mention of confidence in Turkey's goodwill. Well, anyone now knows that Turkey did not allow a single kilowatt of electricity flew into Armenia through that harsh, bitter, cruel winter. And many Armenians suffered and some died as a result of hypothermia. And it was a terrible time. Where was the international condemnation of Turkey? Where is the pressure being put on Turkey uh, to stop this gross violation of human rights against a country with whom it is not at war, a country where I believe the international community should be saying this is an appalling violation of human rights and should bring Turkey to some kind of account uh, for this violation. Mr. Minister, could you give us, could you give us the feeling of your own embassy, of your own country, um, on an issue such as this? Obviously, there has to be enormous frustration, but in what ways do you seek to change the circumstance, aside from coming up to Harvard? <laughs> well, first of all, I'd like to start with the point that you raised, what is, could be done right now quickly to change. Mm -hmm. My answer will be that there is nothing to do at this point that could change immediately the situation in the area. I think there's a long way to go. There is uh, concerted efforts of the uh, international community. I think that Ambassador Marisco mentioned already that the forum for the solution of this problem has been designed, has been created. It has been working very effectively for quite some time. Unfortunately, it didn't come up with the uh, s uh, proposal solution that uh, was accepted by both parties to the conflict and the Armenian government, as you Excuse know. Excuse me, explain to us where this forum is, who's a party to it. The, uh, this forum is the so-called Minsk group, which is created within the framework of the CSC. It started working uh, almost two years ago, and it, uh, it worked out a number of proposals. It went through the difficult, uh, difficulties that Amb Ambassador Mareska could share with you uh, exactly. But the point is that the final proposal so-called time, so timetable that was worked out by last October, if I'm not mistaken, with, uh, was uh, a compromise of the positions of every party involved to this conflict. And it was proposed to the parties to the conflict, direct parties to the conflict, which are Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan, and Armenia as an interesting party as well. And both Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh finally accepted the proposal, though I should mention right now that not everything in the proposal that, that was acceptable, especially for Karabakh Armenians, because uh, the positions of Karabakh Armenians and Armenians are different uh, up to a point. Uh, but unfortunately, Azerbaijan rejected uh, this proposal. By that time, they had new leadership, and this new leadership right now uh, proved uh, what is their choice. As I mentioned, their choice is, is practically war. What is, uh, the new leadership is trying to do right now is to create a status quo on the battlefield. Uh, last December, they launched an unprecedented uh, offensive in, in Karabakh with the use of heavy uh, weapons, aircrafts. And I wanted to add one thing. Is I, I quite agree with Ambassador Mariska that one thing, whatever is to be done, it should be done very quickly, as quickly as possible, because there is a terribly a uh, dangerous element, new element in this conflict, which is the internationalization of the conflict. 
not only the internationalization of the conflict vis-a-vis -vis the involvement of different mediators, but it, which is more dangerous, is the internationalization in the battlefield. We have now a situation when Azerbaijan introduced Mujahids from Afghanistan. There are a number of mercenaries from Russia, Ukraine. Right now you are witnessing the stories from uh, the mostly British newspapers about the oil companies from the United States, from Britain, who are practically using uh, multi-billion dollar efforts to train Azeris there. Uh, there are weapons coming to the territory. The oil, oil companies uh, in the West? Oil in companies in the West, and to be more are exact... Are training fighters? Uh, yes, yes. Do you uh, have figures on that? Any, anything to back that up? Yeah, there, isn't, uh, there are... Uh, mostly what I could tell is from, in the, from the British, British newspaper Independent, but apart from that, we have uh, uh, more evidence to say it uh, officially that, yes, it is called Mega Oil. One of the American companies is called Me Mega Oil. And uh, the articles yeah. were published in the British newspapers. You may heard about the General Secord, who is the retired American general, who, who was behind the initiative of training uh, Azerbaijani units in Azerbaijan. But that is not the case. I mean, there are other. British Petroleum is somehow involved in those areas as well. And maybe uh, Baroness Cox could add to this. You know. What I mean, I mean that Right now, what is happening in the conflict is an absolutely new dimension which is uh, fraught with terrible consequences. And we have to uh, duplicate uh, our efforts in the peace process, which is very important to this. The information that is being passed to me on both sides is, um, is information that suggests, uh, in fact, states on a number of occasions that uh, this agro, agro oil, uh, mega oil, mega oil is um, providing money and uh, I was about to say men, but I get very nervous in this academic environment. Maybe Marvin. there were women there too. Marvin, we can uh, say. Mm -hmm. Ambrosca, can you help us out? What exactly <laughs> yes. is the dimension that we're talking about? Yeah. There and has, the threat of this internationalization. There has been, uh, there has been participation by people who are from outside of the area in this conflict from the beginning on both sides. Are we it's talking, never, we're talking not just about the Russians now? No, uh, although more are Russian than anything else and have been from the beginning. Uh, there are enough uh, unemployed military people in Russia to satisfy all the mercenary needs of all the wars in the world. Uh, and there are lots of them around freelancing. But in uh, any case, there has been on both sides a certain degree of outside participation, but it has never been, up until now anyway, a major factor in the war. Mm -hmm. I think uh, what is being referred to here is the possibility that now it may have a major effect in the war. Now let me just take these points one by one. Uh, there have been, for example, mercenary pilots uh, fighting on the Azeri side. Uh, up until now, they haven't been a major factor in the war. They have been a psychological factor, but the fact is that mercenary pilots don't like to come close to their targets. So they drop their bombs from very high altitudes, and lots of times they drop in fields or wherever. Uh, and so militarily, it, that has not been a factor. It has been, as I say, a psychological terrorist, terrorism factor. On the Armenian side, there have been volunteers, some quasi-volunteers, I would say. Uh, and there are reports of, of uh, people from Russian units stationed in Armenia who go up on the weekends, for example, and participate in the fighting and so forth. So that, all of that has been around for some time. It hasn't been a major factor in the military picture. However, recently, uh, largely because of the uh, humiliations they have suffered on the battlefield, the Azeris have been looking around for help. The Azeris are not great military uh, people. Uh, they're not like the Turks of Turkey in that sense. They don't have the military traditions that Armenians have. I mean, let's face it, five marshals of the Soviet Union came from Karabakh, which is a tiny little mountain area. So these are people who are fighters. They are well organized. They are industrious. They have organized a tank repair factory up in Stepanakert and so forth. Uh, whereas on the Azeri side, the youths mainly pay their doctors to excuse them from military service, and they don't like to fight. And so the Azeris have been looking around for help, and they have brought in uh, we don't know exactly how many, but possibly as many as 1,500 Mujahideen from Afghanistan. 
there are a number of uh, instructors who have been brought in from various places. Uh, so far, this has not been a major factor. Now, uh, mega oil, let me say about mega oil. Mega oil is not a legitimate oil company. We do have very respectable American oil companies, uh, Mobil, Unical, uh, Pennzoil, <clears throat> that are they are legitimately trying to uh, develop contracts for extracting oil. Mega oil is not one of those companies. It is a company which uh, apparently was concocted just to do what it's doing. Uh, if it were possible to prove uh, that they are doing what has been what they've been accused of, they would be prosecutable under U.S. law. Uh, this is something that we have been looking into, trying to establish what the facts are. Uh, but it is definitely something that would be illegal under U.S. law if what they have been accused of is actually going on. But it is not in the same category as the U.S. oil companies that have been out there uh, doing that. Now, another factor is what Baroness Cox, I think, was referring to, and that is a recent report that there may be some uh, British companies that are working up contracts to provide mercenaries or military equipment. And for the first time, we have seen and heard reports of uh, military equipment coming into the conflict from outside. That is to say, up until now, it has all been Russian equipment and ammunition and so forth, because there's lots of that around. In the Caucasus, there is lots and lots of Russian military stuff. Um, but now we've seen Chinese weapons. We've seen plastic, uh, plastic mines from Italy. We've seen a number of things coming in uh, that seem to be coming from elsewhere. Some of it turning up with the Afghans from Afghanistan. There's a lot of stuff in Afghanistan left over from their war. So that's turning up for the first time. That, of course, is very ominous. And especially the participation of units from outside is very ominous, because that could be the first temptation for outside uh, powers to become involved. Lady Cock, could you tell us, aside from uh, published reports, whether there is any government intelligence that you can share with us that would support what it is that the ambassador has just told us? Well, can I say I've got a question down in the House of Lords for Thursday this week, uh, putting uh, to the British government what their position is with regard to these reports. But could I just make one more general please, point? And please. also, then, could I just ask the ambassador one question? The more general point is that I would have liked to have seen much more pressure put by Western governments, and I speak not to the United States government, it's not my place to do that, but to the British government on Azerbaijan to desist from trying to impose a military solution, which is a gross violation of human rights. And here I must make a confession that when I was in Karabakh in uh, the autumn of uh, 18 months ago, I witnessed cluster bombs being used against women and children. That is very different from Armenians coming in to help fellow Armenians, perhaps at weekends, as you put it. This is a very systematic violation with modern warfare against civilians in Karabakh. I've seen children with cluster bomb shrapnel so deep the surgeons can't move it. I went to the British government. I said to the Foreign Office, please, Azerbaijan is a member of the CSCE. Will you prevail upon Azerbaijan to try to desist from this gross violation of human rights? And I said this on the floor of the House of Lords, I am sorry to say that the answer I got from a senior place in the Foreign Office is no country has an interest in other countries, only interests, and we have oil interests in Azerbaijan. And I said, and I've said it before and I say it again, for the first time in my life I was ashamed of being British. Now I think when a country starts to put commercial interests over a concern for human rights, that is not in the long-term interest of that country, let alone the country where the human rights are being violated. Now I'd just like to ask the Ambassador one question if I might. The ambassador implied that one of the problems in the present scenario is that Azerbaijan has been humiliated in the field of battle and therefore is less likely, I think, to make concessions or to go to the negotiating table. Well, I would just like to say that Azerbaijan was very strong in June and the summer of 1992. It was even less prone to any negotiation. That was when they used a massive military onslaught. They overran the Armenian areas of Shamian and Azerbaijan proper. They overran 40% of Karabakh. They perpetrated slaughter on the way. And President al Bey at that time said that if there was a single Armenian still left in Karabakh by October of that year, the people of Azerbaijan could take him and hang him in the central square of Baku. That is a, an explicit statement of ethnic cleansing, if ever I heard one. So when these areas were strong, I don't think they were exactly in a mood to negotiate. I don't see why I'd just like to ask you whether you really feel that if they were to get military strong again, and it looks as if this is the route they're trying to pursue with the mercenaries, with the escalation of the offensive, which everyone knows has happened in the last few weeks, with terrible casualties on both sides. 
Do you really think that strong or weak, they are in a mood to negotiate? I would ask you, Mr. <coughs> Ambassador, to try to do that briefly, because I want to bring Mr. Walsh and Mr. Yes. Taylor into right. a discussion. Well, I, I will answer it briefly, but before doing that, I'd just like to say about human rights. Uh, I don't believe there's anybody who is uh, more strongly a supporter of human rights than I have. I have a record of 30 years. I negotiated the Helsinki Final Act. I've written a lot about this subject. I have been negotiating with the Soviets for all of that period. And, uh, I, you know, I, I am one of the founding fathers of the CSC. I'm the, I am the one, myself personally, who brought Azerbaijan and Armenia into the, into the CSCE along with other countries, and uh, I have fought for human rights all along. And that is the stand that I take, and I believe that it is the stand of the United States government. We do see human rights as an interest of the United States, no matter where they're violated, and that I think is on the record for many years in our government. So maybe it's the position of the British government, it's not the position of the U.S. government, and it's not mine. Uh, but what I said about Azerbaijan was an analysis of what the situation is in Azerbaijan. And I think one has to be clear in analyzing what the situation And let me tell you what it is. It is this, that unless they can recover some kind of dignity, you will get an even worse government in Azerbaijan, even more reluctant to negotiate, even worse about human rights, even more closely aligned with Moscow than you have now. That is the reality, and that is why it's so important to find a solution quickly. By the way, uh, I, at the time when we had El Shabay there, uh, my own feeling was that El Shabay in the, in the Azeri scene was a moderate, was a moderate. And I, at that time, I thought we probably had the best chance of finding a solution because we had essentially moderate presidents in both countries. I'm a great admirer of uh, President Ter Petrosian. I think he's one of the few rational people in that area, by the way. But he, too, is at risk from his opposition. The opposition in Armenia, just as the opposition in Azerbaijan, would take a much harder line. And it would be then much more difficult to find a compromise. I, as a mediator, must look for a compromise. And that means looking at the situation on both sides and trying to see what the possibilities are for reaching some middle ground. In, in light of what has just been described and the difficulties therein. Uh, Mr. Walsh, Mr. Taylor, the frustration must be enormous at your end to try from a humanitarian side to get some of the aid in and to get it in on both sides to help people on both sides because I have a feeling that politics is not your driving force. <coughs> oh, <coughs> what can isn't. you do at this point to get through the politics, through the diplomacy, through the hate in order to get people aid? Well, I would say that, number one, that uh, that's already being done. That um, I think I'd like to make a point between, um, I think I'd like to talk a little bit about human rights and advocacy versus deeds. And that, you know, I think that everybody is very uh, angry and upset about uh, all of the circumstances surrounding uh, the Karabakh. Um, but, you know, I don't know whether we're talking about, you know, a horse that's already out of the barn. And uh, I'm not sure, but I, a lot of my um, remarks were couched on, on uh, what, hap what do you do if that situation is not solvable? I mean, of course, we all would like it to be solved and we can put pressure on lots of people to solve it. But I mean, we have also all been living in uh, Bosnia and uh, you know, many other circumstances. And there are times when maybe a solution is just not possible. You know, the United States is looking inward uh, in, in many ways, although that area of the world is certainly its number one, our number one priority. Many people don't like that, I might add. Uh, Europe is very concerned with its own internal uh, problems. Uh, Japan's economy has gone south. They're looking inward. I mean, it's quite possible that these problems aren't going to be solved. And I, I guess everybody needs to play their role. And uh, as, as uh, Mr. Kalb says, my role is not uh, as a, you know, it's not political. It's more how to uh, work with circumstances when all this is going on. And uh, that our work in uh, Armenia 
despite all the difficulties and the blockade and, and uh, has uh, moved forward. Uh, there's lots of people of goodwill uh, and despite all the frustration and anger, you can get things done. Uh, but uh, it's a very difficult uh, uh, circumstance and uh, one that I think that we as a uh, country must face that maybe is a long-term consequence. That maybe this situation in, the, in Armenia and the Caucasus, maybe we're at a, a 10 year, maybe this is a 10 year process. And so why don't we look at, as, as has been pointed out by Mr. Taylor, how can we develop the Armenian economy? Uh, how can we get more uh, business investment in? How can we move beyond humanitarian assistance? How can we get the health care infrastructure, which I know the best, which is about 40 years, uh, speaking charitably, behind the United States? I mean, these, uh, these other things must move forward while these, the political problems of Nagorno-Karabakh are dealt with, because in the end, there won't, if some of these other things move, don't move forward, and Armenia itself doesn't develop, there won't be the political will to sustain uh, the relationships uh, and uh, the confrontations that are absolutely uh, inevitable in this region, in, even in the most positive scenario. Thank you, I Mr. think we ought to put our energies in Thank you. somewhat towards that. Okay. Thank you. I wanted to get Mr. Taylor and <coughs> Professor Kalikian, and I want to tell you all that if you have questions, please come up to the microphones now. and. Two comments here, and then we'll go to the questions. Yes, please. Yeah, there, the link between the politics and the humanitarian assistance is never. Uh, you, you like you like to think, in some sense, that uh, humanitarian assistance would not be tied to the politics, um, and yet it is. It always is. Humanitarian assistance, as I'm, I'm sure you can describe in great detail, is always political in some sense. An example right now um, is that. Uh, the United States is not allowed to provide any humanitarian assistance uh, to Azerbaijan. Um, now, this is a this is an interesting question that would be I would like to get some sense. We had a talk on the way uh, uh, I was picked up uh, by the uh, uh, two people, uh, Anthony and Nancy, from the. Uh, Armenian Children's Milk Fund uh, at the airport, and we had this conversation on the way in as to whether or not this was a good idea to uh, prohibit assistance uh, to Azerbaijan on humanitarian, uh, on a humanitarian basis. And it might be interesting also for the minister to give a to give a, a view of that. But you cannot separate the politics from humanitarian assistance. It's always political. Um, the the assistance we've given, as I've mentioned, to Armenia, uh, nearly a hundred dollars per Armenian. Uh, is, is contrasted to about $4 uh, per uh, Azeri. Um, and so there, there is this great difference. And the question is, would this help the, the peace efforts to be able to be more even-handed with humanitarian assistance? It's a, it's a question that is worth pursuing. Thank you. Professor Kalikian. Yes, my comment just had to do with the question of building the Armenian economy. With the blockade, we have no economy. We have no business as usual. And I don't see that private enterprise is a political or possibility under these conditions, and these conditions have been going on for three years. I was reading today that there are 11 buses now operating in Yerevan, finally, but no one rides them because there's no place to go to work. People don't work. They don't go shopping because there's no food. So this is all linked, unfortunately. There's no way we can divide the economic blockade. Yeah, I'm just saying, but the, the reality is that if you if you link them, you may be saying there is, will be no economic progress until that issue is resolved, and it may not be resolvable in 10 years. That's a heck of a statement. Okay. I mean, given the suffering that's going on in our Armenia now. Okay, we've got 10 second comments from my right and my left. Okay, just one, two, three. I'd like to comment on the fact that uh, William Taylor mentioned about, he said exactly that Azerbaijan doesn't receive uh, American, U.S. humanitarian assistance. Uh, I want to correct his words, not just that he didn't mean that, just the wording was not correct. And unfortunately, that is being used by the, our Azerbaijani colleagues at the Azerbaijani embassy. The point is that Azerbaijan is receiving U.S. humanitarian assistance. And the system is going to Azerbaijan, not to the government of Azerbaijan, 
but to the most vulnerable people of Azerbaijan, direct assistance. The U.S. government, the U.S. taxpayers' money are going to uh, Azerbaijani people who are uh, need this. But this is not the government-to-government -government assistance, which is uh, forbidden by the uh, amendment to the Freedom Support Act and so on and so forth. I wanted to say another thing. You, you mentioned that $288 million is spent for the humanitarian assistance to Armenia. I think that very few people sitting here know that the major part of this money is going for the trans to cover the transportation cost to get that stuff to Armenia. And the reason for that is the blockade, as uh, were mentioned here. And uh, speaking at this point, I know that the administration is lobbying very hardly for uh, lifting the ban for the government-to-government -government assistance to Azerbaijan. I, I think to do it at this point, before the blockades are lifted, I think it's a tantamount to the uh, Azerbaijanis' uh, blockade efforts and uh, other, other than that. That is what I wanted to comment. Lady Cox. Victory, ten seconds. I wanted to correct a misperception of what you said. What you said was technically accurate, but there is an enormous amount of money going into Azerbaijan for humanitarian aid. It's just going to the NGOs, not to the government. But it doesn't mean to say that American money isn't in there. And we're working in Azerbaijan. I can tell you there is humanitarian aid pouring into Azerbaijan. And rightly so. I'm not against that. To the refugees. I, to correct. the refugees and, right. and to other vulnerable groups. So I don't want people to think that you're not giving any aid uh, to Azerbaijan. And may I just say the Azeris make big propaganda out of it too. They say you're just bypassing the Freedom of Support Act Amendment by giving it to the NGOs. So I just want to put the record straight in the reality. Thank you. OK, we have uh, people on both microphones in the balcony and someone here, nobody here at the moment. We'll start right up there, please. Please give us your name and keep your question as brief as you can. I'm a PhD student. My name is David Snellbecker. I'm a PhD student at the Kennedy School, and I spend most of my time in Ukraine. Uh, my question is to the organizers of this evening. Um, we had the fortunate opportunity to hear very eloquently the Armenian side, and I'm very interested to know uh, why we were unable to hear the, Azerbaij the Azerbaijani side. We heard about, the, ar about Armenian claims to the territory, but it would have been interesting to know about the historical claims of the Azerbaijanis to this land. The question of who, who rightly owns this land is as complicated almost as the question of who owns the land in, in uh, Palestine. I think we, heard, we hear you. We heard about the plate of the... Uh, no, no, we hear... You're, you're, it's not necessary to make a speech, just a okay. question. Like, you asked the question why. I am not one of the organizers, and I don't think anybody on the panel is one of the organizers. Would one of the organizers like to stand up and give an answer? Yes, please. Okay, let's. With all due respect, that I think what the question was asking yeah, is let why me, let me answer Arthur the, Azari let me, reps let me here. Like Would you like to try? Yeah, I'd like Go to ahead. I think the question is legitimate, and there is no question about it. Why? Uh, there is no Azerbaijan here. But I would like to comment on just one thing. Uh, you mentioned. Uh, in putting the question, you mentioned the Armenian claims to the territory. I could tell you that nothing of that nature exists. There is no claim to the territory. The question that Armenian, are, I, I'm talking about the, my government, I'm talking about Armenia proper. The question that we see, it, it is not a question of territory. It is the question of the fundamental rights of the people. We're not claiming the territory. We're trying to uh, show the world that these people has the right uh, to exercise their fundamental right for self-determination. That's a big, big difference. That is my comment that I wanted to mention. Thank you. Question there, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Sagarian, and I say it's Sagarian because I'm tired of saying it's Sagarian, the way Americans say it. Um, quick point, it's election year, so let's not forget to uh, bring this to bear upon Senator Kennedy, because he is being opposed by an Armenian woman who is um, uh, to be used, and I mean it selfishly, uh, this election year. 
uh, to bring our uh, issues up. Quick question, uh, first of all. Please. No, on, not first of all, the quick question. Quick question. On Armenian troops, we read quite a bit about it in the Globe and the Times, acting independently and on their own initiative. And this is uh, committing some of the atrocities that I've read about in the Globe and the Times. Uh, what is the comment for many of the people on the panel about the Armenian military? Are they under the control of the civilian government? And to what extent and are there rogue units doing what they will and how they will to some of these areas? Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Minister, Mr. Ambassador, to take a crack at them, please. Go ahead. You're talking about the control of the, 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 control of the, the Armenian, Armenian army by the, by the Armenian government. And he's talking about atrocities allegedly made, I assume, by the army. You're talking about the atrocities where? In uh, Armenian army in Karabakh, in Azerbaijan? Uh, well, the main problem is that Armenians are being portrayed at often, and why we're not getting the aid and attention that we are, as the aggressors, as the one that are okay, committing not atrocities. Okay. Are we, and are there units out there doing such things without the authorization of the Armenian okay, government? Okay, but let me under answer two points. First of all, there is no Armenian army fighting in Karabakh. Number two, uh, the atrocities in, in this war yeah, I think that you, you can witness atrocities from both sides. Unfortunately, these are the realities of war. When the war starts and the people are forced to protect their homes, families, and you can never control what's going to happen. Yeah, there were atrocities from both sides. As far as I know, the atro atrocities has uh, started uh, the Azer uh, Azeri uh, side. But if, if the question is, there is a, uh, are there atrocities from both sides? The answer is yes. This is the realities of war. This is why we want to stop this war. That is the answer. As far as the second, I want to mention it once again. There is no Armenian army fighting in the territory of Karabakh or Azerbaijan. Lady Cox, do you want to answer that, Mr. Ambassador, as well? Go first. Both of you. <laughs> Go ahead. You, you had suggested that I answer, and I, I am prepared to answer. And I think that an important point uh, comes out of both of these two questions. And that is that you must realize that there are two sides to this issue. There are two sides to every issue. And this issue is not different from every other issue. There are two sides. And that's why I said, as a mediator, one has to look at two sides. I don't think that the other side has been presented here. And, uh, but the conference was about Armenia. And that's why I understood that the side that was going to be discussed was the Armenian problem. Now, it's true. As my colleague from the Armenian Embassy in Washington has just said, there are enough atrocities in this war to go around to the, to the discredit of everyone. This is a vicious war. I have seen roomfuls of dead, body, dead bodies with mutilations. This is a part of the world where it is routine to take family hostages and keep them in the basement. Most of these people never reappear. And I say to you, these atrocities are the responsibility of both sides in this war. I'm sorry to tell you that, but that is the case, and I have seen them. Now, as far as the Armenian regular army is concerned, there I can't agree 100% with my Armenian colleague. There have been instances where the Armenian regular army has been engaged, and in fact, the Armenian government has act actually <coughs> stated that. It actually stated, circulated, uh, at a meeting of the ministers of the CSE, a document claiming credit for having taken a portion of Azeri territory, not in Nagorno-Karabakh, but in another part of the world where there is no Nagorno-Karabakh army. Uh, and there have been other instances like that. In any case, uh, there is enormous support which goes forward. And that has been claimed and quoted uh, to every source from the Armenian president on down. Now, this is understandable in the heat of battle, but it is nonetheless the case that there are instances where the Armenian regular army has been engaged in this conflict. Lady Cox, please. Just two very quick points. First, yes, of course, sadly, there are atrocities on both sides, but from the evidence I've been able to gauge from first-hand encounters, there is an asymmetry. On the question, for example, of the treatment of hostages and prisoners of war, we've always been given unlimited access to Azeri prisoners of war, Azeri hostages, <coughs> excuse me, being kept in Karabakh. ICRC are given access. On the whole, the conditions are good, and I have not seen brutal maltreatment of those prisoners. I've seen a very different situation in Azerbaijan. 
my colleagues have from the Andrei Sakharov Foundation, and I know that the major human rights organizations have a real difficulty of gaining access to prisoners and hospitals in Azerbaijan. Those whom I've seen have been brutally maltreated and tortured. I think there is an asymmetry. I would like all international human rights organizations to step up their pressure to gain access to see what is happening to Armenians in Azeri custody the same way that they are already allowed to see the Azeris in Armenian custody. So I think there's an asymmetry there. As far as Armenians being portrayed as the aggressors are concerned, um, I can tell you from having spoken to the men on the front line who are now occupying the high proportion of Azerbaijan, you said the Karabakh forces are occupying, they don't want to be there. I was in Karabakh last June when the Azeris broke that ceasefire which the Armenians, the Karabakhis, and the Azeris had signed. Um, the uh, Karabakhis didn't want to sign it, as you know, it meant they had to give back Kolbajar. They did sign it. Before the ink was dry, the Azeris started shelling Stepanakert again. I was there, I was witness to it. The taking of Agdam, of Fizuli, and Jebrail, the parts of Azerbaijan proper, the Karabakhis didn't want to do that. They lost a lot of life in doing so. The military commander in Agdam, I had a Polish journalist with me, he said, do you want to stay here? He said, of course I don't want to stay here. Who wants to sit here in the middle of Azerbaijan? Karabakh is big enough for us. All we want to do is live in our own land. And I think that is the overwhelming position of the Armenians of Karabakh. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my uh, sad responsibility to point out that we have 15 minutes left and quite a few people who would like to ask questions. We have an extraordinarily articulate panel, so it's hard for the questions to be brief and the answers to be brief, but let's try to keep it in mind anyway. Please. <clears throat> Dr. Paul Barsom, and my question is directed at Ambassador Maresca. Mr. Ambassador, first of all, thank you for your efforts in regard, in regard to peace, and uh, hopefully we will see that. I'd like to ask you if you would uh, kindly comment regarding any changes in the United States foreign policy within the past year towards Armenia as a result of these allegations of violations of human rights in Nagorno-Karabakh. And I would uh, want Lady Caroline Cox to uh, further comment on that too, please. Well, I don't, I don't think so, no. I th we, when we started into this issue, uh, we deliberately decided to take an impartial position on the issue. And that was for a very simple reason. Uh, you cannot help to bring about a solution if you're on one side or the other. And it was our objective to bring about a solution as quickly as possible, and therefore we deliberately chose an impartial position condemning violence and human rights violations on both sides. And we have done that. Uh, every time there has been uh, a clear violation on one side or the other, we have condemned it and uh, pressed the sides to, to rectify that. I think this is a, personally, I believe this is an important role of the United States. Uh, one of the things you realize when you represent the United States overseas, and especially when you represent the United States as a negotiator or a mediator, is that there are very few countries in the world that can stand there and say, this is right and this is wrong. And the United States is such a country uh, we can do that because of the respect with, with which we are held in the world and for many other reasons, partly because of our clout. And so that is a role that we have, and I think that that is a role that we at least have tried to play in this, in this conflict. Now, you cannot bring about an end to a conflict unless the sides want it. And basically, throughout the history of this conflict, either one side or the other has uh, been inclined to fight rather than to join in peace agreements. Right now, it's the Azari side. So, but I don't think there has been any change in U.S. policy. Our objective has been to condemn violence or human rights violations on one side or the other and to maintain an impartial position in the middle to try to help to find a solution. Uh, would you like to ask a question? Yes, sir. And uh, I've heard from the panelists today that it seems that Armenia or Karabakh is receiving an unfair share of humanitarian aid. Could you please tell me of the 12 countries that could receive this aid, which country is in a position as Armenia is today so that they would also receive the kind of aid that Armenia is getting? Mr. Taylor, would you like to comment? I will try. Uh, all 12 countries are receiving assistance. Uh, what we try to do is, in particular on the technical, the economic, the democracy assistance, 
We try to gear that assistance to those countries that are farthest along on reform, on economic reform, on political reform. Separate from that, we have the humanitarian assistance that, that I've spoken of and the 288 million that I've described as the largest uh, number of dollars per capita going to Armenia uh, is, is, uh, is, a, is a sense in which we have recognized the difficulties and the, and the hardships and the horror uh, that Armenians are face today. So that is by far the largest per capita that has gone to Armenia. No, no, I don't think anyone has said, I haven't heard anyone say that this was unfair or inappropriate. Uh, that was not the implication that I've heard. No, uh, I, I, no I'm, I'm just saying that the impression seems to be that Armenia is getting more. Um, when you said $100 per person, that, that other countries of the 12 are not getting that. And I'm saying what other country would be in a position to receive that because of the dire situation that there is in Armenia? The other countries uh, that are in very bad shape um, are Georgia, and Tajikistan. But they're, not, but they're not at war and they're not blockaded. Tajikistan is essentially at war. And Georgia, Georgia is, is war essentially also. at war. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll go to the balcony for our next question. Up there, please. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Ambassador Mariska. Your name? Uh, Eric Sov. I'm an undergraduate. That's all. Um, <laughs> Good. All right. The question is this. Um, Turkey has always had a very friendly relationship with the United States. It served as a buffer against communism in the Cold War, and now it serves as a buffer against Islamic fundamentalism to the south. How truly wholehearted has efforts been, have the efforts been to get Turkey to lift the blockade? You said that it's been brought up uh, many times, uh, at, even at the presidential level. But we haven't really heard about it. There has been no condemnations of Turkey's uh, basic impe impediment of humanitarian aid efforts to get into Armenia. Um, if, is there a conflict that right now between, between our commitment to Turkey, uh, a friendly commitment where we need them to buffer against Islamic fundamentalism and our efforts to you know, have them remove the blockade? Is there a basic conflict there that is weakening U.S. efforts to have them uh, lift the blockade? Well, certainly you're, you're right in pointing out the fact that we have a very complicated relationship with Turkey and lots of fish to fry, if you will, with Turkey, and that does mean that you have to have some kind of uh, trade-offs, that's for sure. Um, but I don't think that we have pulled our punches on this, uh, on this uh, question with Armenia. We have participated in sponsoring UN resolutions, UN Security Council resolutions, which specifically were intended uh, to oblige Turkey uh, to uh, at least let humanitarian aid pass, because that, I think, is the line one has to draw. Uh, that humanitarian aid should always be permitted through. After all, it is intended for, uh, for the old, for the babies, and so forth. So why should that be held up, either by Turkey for Armenia, or for that matter, in pr providing aid to uh, Azerbaijan? I think that humanitarian aid should be accepted. And that's what our attempt has been, to, to reach exceptions. Uh, but, but is there a risk to alienate Turkey? Is there a risk that perceived at higher levels of foreign policy, perhaps, uh, maybe even at Clinton's level, to yeah. Hang that on. we may alienate our... There are other people who would like to ask a question. Uh, I, let me answer that. Uh, the, uh, no, I don't think there's that risk. Uh, we do have... Uh, but Tur Turkey is a, is, a, is a big country with a lot of interests. It is harder now to influence Turkey than it was a few years ago. We have tried in the past to use tough policies with Turkey. At one point, we tried to cut off aid to Turkey on a similar issue. And the, the result was that they put the squeeze in our bases, and we wound up a few years later having to give in to the Turks. And now, Turkey, with its expanded interests and its expanded sense of its own importance, is much harder to influence on these things than it was before. Thank you. Just, just a quick comment. OK. I think I, <clears throat> I just uh, want to comment on this issue. First of all, I've been witnessing the US uh, government approach towards uh, Turkey. We have been working with the US administration on that. And we, we asked the US to exercise its leverage in Turkey. And I could tell that. I could tell you that uh, the U.S. government has done a lot as far as this is concerned, to the point that they, they could do. Of course, we wanted more, but uh, we understand the realities and we appreciate what they've done. But at the same time, I, th I, I want to say one another thing. I don't agree. Uh, I hate to disagree with the ambassador with the great deal of respect that I have to him. But I think that, that Turkey, uh, he, he mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, he mentioned that uh, there is a public opinion problem in Turkey, and the Turkish government should uh, 
understand that at the same time, uh, later he said that there is a public opinion in Azerbaijan and LGB should understand and Aliyev should understand and everybody should understand. And Levon Petrosan as the president of Armenia should understand that as well. And I could tell you one thing. It was not that easy for president of Armenia to go to Karabakh and to convince the leadership of Karabakh to agree to the, to the proposal that was proposed by, uh, by the CSC. Anyhow, he did it and he got it. So when we're talking about the leadership, it is, uh, we have to bear in mind that the leadership is elected by the people, but it acts for the people. Uh, and the second quick thing I, 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 quick, <laughs> I wanted to mention, <laughs> that I think that Turkey, being as a member of the CSCE group, I think Turkey is one of the countries, the two I should say countries, which is unfortunately not impartial in those. And I think it's a mistake by the Turkish government that uh, they trapped themselves in this mistake. And unfortunately, right now, they are not considered to be a neutral uh, uh, part to this uh, in the group, of, in the Minsk group. And I think it, it's a mistake with the uh, Turkish government, but they did it. That's, uh, that's my question. Question on the balcony, please. Uh, my name is David Boyajin. My question is for Ambassador Moreska. Sir, do you believe that Turkey committed genocide against Armenians in 1915? And will you state that unequivocally? And could you please tell us the uh, position on this issue of the President of the United States? So he asked it, very nice. First, let me say that uh, it's not my role here to defend Azerbaijan's position. Uh, what I have been trying to say to you in my answers is that if you are going to be a mediator, and I am a mediator, then you have to see that there are two sides to an issue and try to find a middle ground. And uh, unfortunately, there's not an Azeri representative up here. So you see my position as being at one extreme. But in fact, if you had an Azeri representative up here, you would see that I'm in the middle. Now, uh, I can't answer your question. I can't answer your question, first of all, on behalf of the President of the United States, because frankly, I don't know what his view is on this. And I'm not even sure he's reflected on it deeply, but maybe he has. If he has, I don't know what his answer is. And I can't answer your question for myself either, and I'll tell you why. Because I'm a mediator, and I have to retain a certain credibility with both sides. Otherwise, I'm unable to do my job. I don't believe it is useful on this problem to go to delve too much into the past history. I said earlier, I think Armenia must work out a satisfactory, normal relationship with Turkey. That is a vital interest of Armenia's, and it will not help if, uh, if Armenia's principal concern in that relationship is the history of what happened 70 or 80 years ago. I just don't think it's helpful, and for that reason, I, I can't answer your question. Okay, uh, we've got only... <laughs> I think the way this is going, we've got time for one more question. May I, Caroline Ujarian? Um, given that uh, political process doesn't seem to be working and the military process mm -hmm. is not working from our point of view, um, what else could be done to bring about a solution to this if the U.S. government cannot pressure Turkey to lift the blockade? For example, what would you say to us? What do we need to do in order to force more pressure to be brought. I think of um, the economic sanctions against various countries in the world who have uh, violated human rights in gross way. Um, South Africa, it's a long time, but changes have been brought about in South Africa. Um, why can't something similar that, to that be brought about, and what would the community at large have to do in order to force our government into that kind of position? I'm sorry, you know, in a way that these questions all get directed at Ambassador Moresco. No, I, I don't there mean. There are so many other people I don't on the panel to, uh, with I a think, great deal to say. Yeah, I would, I would ask that of all the panel members. Well, that's I don't think a, we got time now for all <laughs> the panel members to answer, and the question legitimately goes to Ambassador Moresco. But if anybody else would like to. Chip in, this is your moment to do it because we've run out of time. Would you like, Mr. Walsh was the one who said there are problems in the world that don't get solved sometimes. And there may be a 10 year process involved on this one. That's what he said. I do believe that the Armenia, economic development of Armenia can take place 
without the resolution of this uh, situation. That uh, the United States is, has been playing the role of the blockade buster. That's what its role has been through humanitarian assistance. And I think that what the Armenian uh, American community and diaspora might consider doing is get them to play the blockade, to continue to be the blockade buster, but to move them towards blockade buster for economic and development and to engage. There's a lots of things that the American government can do to uh, stimulate investment. The, the American government has tremendous leverage with the multilateral institutions, with countries throughout the world, and I think that a, a strong Armenia is going to, uh, in, in any case, is what uh, will be helpful to the resolution of this situation and the staying power to resolve it. Thank you. Thank you. Lady Cox, did you want to say something? Just a, a very quick comment. Quick Speaking wrap. Of, yes, just quick. <laughs> as as a, somebody who's primarily concerned with human rights, humanitarian need, I think that I'm very concerned when governments of whatever complexion I speak about my own, not about American, uh, moderate their criticism of human rights violations because of strategic or commercial interest. I think that if you, uh, you said in the American context you have other fish to fry, therefore you may well have to moderate what one says in certain contexts. Britain, I'm afraid, tends to do that. The danger there is twofold. One is you lose your own credibility. When you do speak out in certain regimes, you don't have commercial interests and you don't speak out in regimes where you do have commercial interests, then not only do you lose your credibility and appear opportunistic, but also ultimately, and this is most serious, I think, for the future of the world, the values, the principles themselves get devalued. I think that some of the greatest contributions Western civilization has made to the world have been the values of democracy, of tolerance and pluralism, respect for human rights. When we're selective about criticizing regimes which violate human rights, we devalue those values themselves, and I think that could be very serious for the future of the international community. And that's what worries me most about this. The minister says that he has a quick comment yeah, that he would like to make. <laughs> Ten seconds. I think that uh, I quite agree with Dr. Walsh saying that uh, Armenia could uh, develop economically under the blockade. It is possible to do it. It is possible to create a model of economic development under the circumstances that you are in the blockade. But I think that's not the right way to plan our future. I think we have to think about getting out of this blockade, and the right way to get out of this blockade is the peace. I think we have to invest more and more into the peace, and this is the only way out of the degradation in the conflict. And I think we have to be a little bit more and more flexible, work together with the partners in the CSC group, be more careful, more attentive to the problems that the other side is facing, and I think we have to achieve peace as soon as possible because this is the future of the I think that I think that we would all share the minister's view that there ought to be peace brought to the area as quickly as possible. And uh, if it was all a matter of goodwill and wisdom, I'm sure it would have happened by now. But sadly, it is not just a matter of goodwill. As we know from the problems in Armenia and the problems in so many other parts of the world. I am asked to mention to you the photographs that are hanging here, which are part of the Armenian children on the edge exhibit, which you are welcome to take a look at, at the end of this uh, very interesting, uh, very emotional presentation on the part of so many people both asking the questions and responding to the questions. And those people who feel themselves in the middle are always edged towards the edge <laughs> when you get into a discussion, and we understand that too. But I am very grateful to all of our panelists. They have been wonderful, and you have too. So thank you all very much for coming. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.